and welcome to Start Right Here, a podcast where we discuss breaking in, standing out, and the path to success in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Corinne Corbett, and I hope the conversations I have with my guests inspire you to forge a path of your own. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to have you back for another episode of Start Right Here. And today I'm so happy to welcome Maisie Dunbar, who is president of the global award-winning Maisie Dunbar Beauty Brands. Today, we're going to talk about not only establishing a business as an entrepreneur, but having a global footprint where you're making sure that businesses are established around the world. And that's one of the things that Maisie does. And we're going to find out how she does that. So welcome, Maisie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I feel honored. I met you several years ago on set with Essence when you were at Essence and we've developed this sisterhood. Um, Also been a part of your beauty girls camp. Can you give us your 30 second bio? My name is Maisie Dunbar. I am the president and founder of the global award winning Maisie Dunbar Beauty Brands. I'm also a single mom. I am um, a TED Talk speaker. I'm also a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador. I am a nail influencer, a licensed manicurist, master esthetician, and a makeup artist and a massage therapist. I'm also a change agent for beauty and a global citizen for beauty. That's me. I love the Global Citizen for Beauty. You have like mastered all the licenses that you could get. Oh yeah. (laughs) I sure did. Cause you know what? Oftentimes as a spa owner, the only thing I didn't do was hair because I wasn't really interested. You know, having staffing as you well know with businesses and especially you've been in the beauty space for a long time. So people would come to me and try to tell me what I should pay them. I'm like, I'm telling you 50%, 50% of nothing is nothing. I'm licensed, Jack. So that's one of the things that made me get licensed in all areas of business that I offered. And on top of that, just a thirst for knowledge. So I just kept going and kept going. That's fantastic. Do you think that the beauty industry was a destination or a detour for you? I think it was a detour, but I have landed at my destination. Expound upon that a little bit. Okay. When I say it was a detour... Growing up in Africa, I was always fascinated by beauty, but it was never nurtured. These parents today, they see a skill set in their child and they nurtured it. Back in my day, in your day, you better open those books, honey. You got to be a doctor or something. So coming from the African culture, it was never encouraged. So when I went to college, I was a systems analyst. I was working for British Telecom. I got laid off my job. And one of my coworkers actually found the nail school for herself on our lunch break one day. And she was like, Maisie, your nails always look nice. You should go to nail school. And then the guy that was doing my nails at the time always told me my nails always looked nice and I should go to nail school. So I just went to learn how to do my own. But I just really sucked. I sucked at it really bad. (laughs) Because I sucked at it, I just was like, I got to master this thing. So I was going around, taking classes. And then, believe it or not, every single African-American manicurist that I reached out to in the Washington, D.C. area that I asked that I could like chaperone or just sit and observe, because I was coming from corporate, and they all told me no. So the more they told me no, the more I sorted out to seek education. And I can honestly tell you the Caucasians in the beauty industry embrace me. If you follow me, you will see that most of my core, when it comes to my level of excellence, they're all surrounded by a bunch of white people because those are the people that really embraced me. And they started to share educational classes and stuff with me where I could go to distributors to classes. And then six months later, I had gotten another job with FDA. I was working in the MIS department with FDA. And my supervisor knew that I did nails part-time. So I went to her and I remember my dad telling us growing up that if you did things part-time, you always get part-time results. And I was so fascinated by beauty. And I was like, I got to do this. I got to figure out a way to do this as a single parent. How am I going to feed my child? So I just woke up one day, went to my boss and told her that 
I was going to be quitting in two weeks to do nails full time. And she said, do you have a clientele? I was like, no, I'm going to get a clientele. And I saw something either on your page on LinkedIn that had Mickey right on it. So the salon that I started, you know, I was working with Mickey and all of them. And I just went out there and I grind. I literally had a script. I used to go to the bus stop. And I would say, hi, my name is Maisie. Can I give you a free manicure? Really? I'm not crazy. Honestly, I'm not crazy. But I just got out of school. I need to practice because my thing was, if people saw me doing nails all the time, they would think I was good. I figured practicing on a human would be a lot better than practicing on a fake hand because each hand is different. So it would train my eyes for design. And that was my whole method to my madness. And that's how I built my clientele. When you were at those people at the bus stop in D.C., what did they say? I'm telling you, they would look at me like, that's why my comeback had to be quick. They would look at me like, oh, so no, I'm not crazy. I literally just got out of beauty school and I just need to practice. So I will give you a free manicure. I promise you, I won't butcher your nails. All I want to do is practice. So people just thought, oh my God, Macy is always busy. Girl, I was racking up a bunch of free manicures. I probably did over a thousand free manicures. That was a really smart strategy, though, to have a script, to go to where the people were, because, you know, the people in the bus stop aren't leaving till the bus gets there. <laughs> <laughs> you only know that if you've taken the bus, folks. Exactly. <laughs> if you grew up taking the bus, you know all about waiting at the bus stop. Yeah. But I want to go back. So you worked as a systems analyst. Yes. What skills did you take from, you know, working in corporate and then taking into the beauty industry? Not just entrepreneurship, but actually when you work in a salon. I think the skills of resiliency. I think the skills of no doesn't mean no. No means on. I think the skill set of being on time and taking accountabilities. Because when you're working for corporate, you got to be accountable for yourself. And I know as artisans, when I first got into the beauty industry and became a salon owner, I was like, these people, are they raised by dogs or something? (laughs) Because I was like, what the heck? (laughs) I encourage anyone listening to this, if you think we're going to the beauty industry, go work for corporate America at least for six months. Because it teaches you some strategies. And discipline. Oh, that's the word. Discipline. Your boss tell you to be to work at eight and you roll up in there at nine o'clock and think you're still going to keep your job? Heck no. That is actually a good point. So you first started in a salon that someone else owned and doing nails. I actually first started at a barbershop. Get out. Mm -hmm. My first job. And I often thank him when I'm on stage, anywhere I'm speaking, if I'm talking about beauty, I never forget him. My first job was at Up Next hair salon in Wheaton, Maryland. And my boss was Ronnie Morgan. I didn't even have my license yet. I had not even sat for the boards. I think I was going to the boards like two weeks after I started there. So all I was doing were manicures there. And he gave me that opportunity. And I was only there on, I think, Thursday and Friday because they had another manicure. This was a shared space. And it got to the point where their weekend manicurist, after I got my license, she wanted to be full time. So then they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do with me. And I think I was there for like maybe four months. And I decided that I wanted to do more women. So then I got a job. My next job was at Kelly Heron, which was a very popular hair salon at the time, which is where I went met Mickey. Mickey was the hairstylist. And when I went to work for Miss Kelly, she said that she was only doing booth rental. I was like, Miss Kelly, I don't have a clientele. So she said, I gave you 30 days to get a clientele. That's why you came up with your bus stop strategy. Yes. And I had a son. I had a young child. You know, I was a single mom. So I had to feed my son. So I was at Miss Kelly for like, I think about a year. And then Miss Kelly was selling the salon. And one of my other co-workers who worked at Kelly Harem had moved to another hair salon. And their manicurist who had a full book, she was from the Philippines and she was moving back to the Philippines. So she called me and she was like, oh, Maisie, the manicurist is leaving. You should talk to Keith Tate. He owns Salon Obsessions. And that's where I was for a very long time. And then when I started, I started really small. I started with a nail studio. And I was so booked out. I was like, I can't do all these people. So what I started doing was I started hiring assistants at the local schools. I started to volunteer my time at the local schools to speak to their students. And then I created a relationship with the instructors 
So of course they handpicked the best students for me. And I started bringing people in in my nail studio as assistants. So then when I expanded, I continued that. And that's just the way I did my business. That was my business strategy for hiring, period. So you had obsessions and then you opened your own nail studio from there? Yes. Okay. Because you were so booked out that you've decided that you could go out on your own at that point? Yes. And I would recommend for people listening, when your book is really booked, it's a good time to either bring someone under you and that person is assisting you. There's nothing wrong with starting small. Now move to a small space. It's just you and that person. So that person is basically either taking your overflow or that person is assisting you where they're taking polish off, they're putting polish on, and you can definitely curate the work of that assistant before you actually give them a client. So it's almost like a training program. Exactly. I didn't know that back then, though. I can tell you the truth. I did not know what I was doing. All I knew was I had a full book and I had two hands and I needed two extra hands. <laughs> I hear you. So when you expanded, is that when it became the Maisie Dunbar Spa Lounge? We started as M&M Nails. And then I went to M&M Nails and Wellness Center. Because that's when I started to do skincare and massages. And I actually got into the massage business honestly, was because my mom was sick and they had her on all this medication. All the stuff that people are talking about now is stuff that I've been doing all my life. So I was like, there's got to be a better way for mom, you know? So I went to massage school to help my mother. And and being in massage school, for me, I always try to look for the best places I can get education. So I would go to places like Florida, Arizona, because those were the best places that had continuing education. Those were the best places that had like the best resorts. So that's what I did. My first expansion was Eminem Nails and Wellness Center. So then fast forward, I had outgrown that space. One of my mentors was Robert Bob from Robert Andrews Day Spa here in Crofton, Maryland. And I reached out to him and he referred me to a business strategist. Because you got to know that you know, and you got to know what you don't know. This is very true. And you also have to be open for people to make recommendations. You can make recommendations to me all day, but if I'm not open, that's how people don't grow. And unfortunately for us, people of color, sometimes that's what keeps us where we are. So he referred this gentleman to me. He's now deceased as a business strategist. And he came into my salon the first day. At the end of the day, you know, he audited all we had going on. He was like, you got to move out of this space. You've outgrown this space. I was like, but where do I go? He said, secondly, you got to change your name. I was like, what? I was like, I can't change my name. He was from New Jersey. You know. He's very direct. Yes, exactly. He was Italian and he was from New Jersey. So you already know. He was like, look, I just came to meet you. I got to catch my train back to New York. These are the things I want you to do. Change the name, find a space. And I'll call you tomorrow. He said, go and Google Eminem Nails and go and Google Maisie Dunbar and call me in the morning and let me know what name we're going to go with. And he literally walked out of my salon just like that. Wow. So, of course, I didn't wait till I got home. I Googled it right away. So when he was in the car, I called him. I said, we're going to go with Maisie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Maisie Dunbar Spa Lounge was born. So we expanded into a larger space. So we moved from maybe a 1,300 square foot facility to a 2,500 square square foot facility. Wow. Had you thought about entrepreneurship like before you got all the way in like this? To be quite honest, no. I just love what I do. And I just felt like I was going to work to play. And the funny thing about it is when I worked for British Telecom, I actually had a mild stroke from stress. I was 24 years old. So when I found the beauty industry, I was like, oh my God, I can wear two different pairs of socks. I'm like, I can be free, free at last. Yes, yes, yes. I love that the business strategist was like, Google your own name, Google Eminem. What did you find when you Googled Eminem though? Girl, when I Googled Eminem, there were plumbing companies. He was like, what are you, a plumber? Huh, what are you, a plumber? Are you in the beauty industry? You know? Man, I tell you, I have taken some whippings. Between him and Kim Barboza, golly. So he was like, what are you, a plumber? And literally when I Googled Eminem Nails, 
the first two pages was like plumbing companies, this, that. And when I Googled myself, like the first two pages was all the stuff that I've done. I was like, oh my God, okay, we're going to go with this then. But I wish he was still alive because of him, you know, I made the decision to take his advice. And I think oftentimes with us, we don't do that. Yes. And he wasn't giving you that much time to think about it either, which I appreciate that. He was like, don't call me tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) And he literally walked out like, you go ahead and marinate on that. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. I got a train to catch. I got clients in New York and I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. I see your passion. I see where you can go and I see it in you. And because based on the referral, I can help you, but you got to be ready to help yourself. And I think that was key because oftentimes people want to help us, but we're not ready to help ourselves. Yeah. And that's across any area of our lives. You got to be willing and open to accept the help and sometimes to hear the hard truth. Exactly. Talk to me about assembling a staff. How do you find a good staff? So first you got all your licenses. You know how everything is supposed to flow in terms of skill set. Yes. So that's one thing. So you know how to assess skill, but how do you find the people? Well, for starters, I'd never hire skill. I hired attitude. I could develop skill. Secondly, I'm from a family of attorneys. My dad was an attorney and a judge. So everything in my salon, when you walk in there, you were signing your life away. Everything was documented. So I trained you from the moment you walked in. Like I told you, I volunteered at school. So I had a filtration of students coming through. And while they were in school, they worked with me as my assistant. They assisted me on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. They assisted the salon on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In one of the first places everyone started in my salon, I didn't care how skilled you were. I didn't care how many licenses you had. You started at the front desk. You had to sit at the front desk. If someone said to me, well, I can't sit at the front desk, that right there told me that you weren't trying to grow. So we didn't even need to move any further. It's funny, when I pivoted my business, I was doing training for MGM here in Maryland. And one of the nail professionals there, when I showed up, she said, I came to your salon several years ago to get a job, but you didn't hire me. And I'm like, I don't remember you. I said, why didn't I hire you? She said, because I said I wouldn't take out trash. I said, that's why I didn't hire you. Because I took out trash. So everyone had to take out trash. Everything I expected from my team was what I did. If I wasn't busy and you came in the salon and one of my technicians was running behind, whether it was a skincare therapist, a massage therapist, like part of our culture was we never allowed our guests to just walk to the front desk. You had to escort that guest to the front desk. So if the skincare therapist was escorting the guests to the front desk and I was free, I would turn the room over for them. So we all work together as a team. So every skill set that everyone had, there was a certain degree that you needed to know. The skincare therapist needed to know how to set up for manicure and pedicure. The manicurist needed to know how to set up for wax because everything in my environment was an experience. Even if someone came for a Brazilian wax, we gave them an experience with that Brazilian wax. Whether it was wipes on the bed, whether it was sanitizer, you know, all of that, it was an experience for them. If it was a person, we also gave them modesty towels. Even if it was a Brazilian, we gave them disposable panties to put on because some women, especially women of color, some of us are not very comfortable. So the technician needed to walk in and let them feel comfortable first before taking it. But people of other nationalities, you walk in a room, they're just like spread eagle. Come on, let's do this. But that was my hiring strategy. Start Right Here is brought to you by Beauty Biz Camp, where we equip and inspire the next generation of industry leaders. Head over to our website, beautybizcamp.com, for more information and sign up for our mailing list so you can stay in the know about our upcoming programming. One of the other things that I would highly recommend also for people who are hiring We are hiring people sometimes in the beauty industry that have never been served. Sometimes they come from underserved communities. Sometimes they come from battered homes and they don't know. And we're asking them to give our clients 
top service, but they have never been exposed to it. So one of the things that I also did was I took my staff to like the Ritz Carts and the Four Seasons because I wanted them to be served so they can then come and be a servant to our clients. That is powerful. And what made you realize that? Because I don't think a lot of people think about the fact that sometimes we're asking somebody to perform a skill that they've never experienced and they don't know how to do it. What made me realize that was, first of all, I'm a giver and I wanted to give them something because I heard like teachers would say, oh, this is the background she comes from and da, 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 da. So once they came in and I realized that from them, I quickly said, you know, I'm expecting these girls to give top level customer service and they've never experienced it. So they can listen to me all day long, but if they experience it themselves, they cannot make the connection. Like one time I booked a spa day at the Four Seasons. And when I tell you afterwards, we met for a huddle. I took them to lunch. We met for a huddle. And at the lunch, it was hilarious. So like, Miss Maisie, did you see the toenails on the floor? It was all the way in the corner. I don't even think they sweep the floors properly. Because <laughs> in my salon, if you drop a polish on the towel, consider the towel yours. Don't even put it back on the shelf. So they were like, did you see the towels? The towels were like mildew. Not mildew, but they weren't white no more. They were like beige. You need new towels. When I tell you, I was cracking up. But it was so great to see them. And it was always a game changer for them. And then it would motivate them for us to meet our numbers because they knew if we met our numbers, I was going to treat them to something. That's wonderful. So let's talk about Bluffer Joe. Yes, ma'am. What made you start it? And tell us about the line. I started Bluffer Joe after my mother passed away. Most especially people of color and women of color When we have major losses, we have a tendency to sit back and do inventory of what it's going to look like next. So I remember when my mom passed, I started to think of my Aunt Sophie. My Aunt Sophie was such a savvy businesswoman in Liberia. And if anybody tell you they're from Liberia, just ask them, do you know of Sophie's ice cream? Any of the who's who of Liberia went to Sophie's ice cream. But when Sophie died, that died. So I started to look at my salon, my spa, and I'm like, wow, if I die today or tomorrow, you know, all my equipment is paid for, all this is paid for, but my legacy dies. I did makeup actually before I even did nails. Makeup came to me naturally. Then I also started to think about when I'm in my 50s and 60s, can I really do this physical job? I don't think my body can handle it, but I know my brain can. So I then enrolled in makeup school and I then enrolled in ingredient school to learn ingredients. So I did both of those simultaneously as I was running my spa. So when I finished, I was at a trade show in LA and I was just sitting at the bar, you know, a couple of months after my mom had died. And I was just really thinking about my mom because my mom will always go to that particular trade show with me. And because she always went to that trade show with me, everybody that saw me, they're like, Mason, how's your mom? So I was crying all over the place. So I was sitting at the bar and I ran into, at the time, the chemist for OPI and the chemist for what is now CND. And they were like, Mason, so what's next for you? I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about get into the makeup space. I just finished an ingredient class, but I just really need to get a really good chemist that specializes in makeup. So the chemists that I first found, I must say, I gave them credit all the time because they are the ones that recommended my first chemist. So when we first started, we started by selling raffle tickets and we only started with four lip glosses. Because I'm a person that I feel is all about the start. If I start, I'm going to keep running. So I just got to start, even if I start with one. So the name of Bluffer Joe, my younger sister named it because I was trying to play around with the name and everybody was like, well, name me your name. I'm like, I am not that crazy about my name. So my younger sister was like, what about Bluffer Joe? So I was like, yes, it's unique enough. It resonates with Liberia. And so that's why we went with the name Bluffer Joe. So Bluffer Joe is a term in Liberia that is referred to not unique to a woman, but anyone, a person that is always well-dressed, always well put together, possesses confidence, 
and they'll call you a bluffer Joe. So that's how the name was born. I can't take credit for that either. All I can take credit for is all this hard work. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew the meaning of the name. That is a fabulous meaning. So even in Liberia, like from the airport on, people normally don't even call my name. Or they're like, oh, Bluffer Joe, you back? Bluffer Joe, you back? I'm like, yeah, I'm back. So that's the meaning of it. So you started with four lip glosses and then... How did it expand? First of all, what was the reception like for it? I mean, obviously people must have loved it for you to make it bigger, but how did you market it? To be honest with you, I took it for granted. I got it and it just kind of coexisted in my spa. It did well. We sold it in the spa and it did well in the spa because we had a great clientele and when clients came, they bought it. Granted, at that time, we had a website for Bluffer Joe. But to be honest with you, I didn't even learn the trenches of Bluffer Joe up until three years ago when I pivoted my business and then a year ago when COVID hit. That's when I really have learned the e-commerce spacing and all this stuff. Before then, Bluffer Joe just coexisted with Maisie Dunbar. You know, it did well in the spa and that's how we were able to expand. And now we have 269 products. And for people like you that's just believing in me and seeing my hard work, seeing my commitment, seeing my resiliency and giving me platforms to showcase my gift. That's how we expanded people like you. Let's talk about the pivot. So you pivoted your business as you talked about you wanted to leave a legacy. So tell me how you pivoted. One of the ways that I pivoted was going back home to the continent, working with women and the youth in underserved communities back home, taking their natural skill sets that they have, because as you well know, there's no structure or maybe you don't know, but there's no structure here. We have licensing and all this stuff. They don't have that there. They have schools there, but the schools are just very run down. But yet you have these very passionate people that really want to make a living, that really want the best for themselves to do better for their families. Because oftentimes whoever is working is taking care of maybe 10 or 15 persons. So I pivoted by going back home and I started to look for distribution on the continent. So I did a lot of footwork myself. But once again, you have to know that you know and you have to know that you don't know. So when COVID hit, part of my pivot and me not knowing, I stumbled upon U.S. commercial services. I enrolled once again in an export program through U.S. commercial services. I did not know that the U.S. government have a program such as that, that literally help U.S. businesses that want to do business in countries abroad. In my case, it was two African countries. Again, people have to be willing to pay a fee for what they want. But I can honestly tell you that enrollment with U.S. commercial services and trade.gov has been the best part of my pivot. Because in order for me to give more to the continent and to my people, and I'm not talking about people of African descent per se, just people of color worldwide, I have to have more to give more. So by having distribution in these countries, I'll be able to hire more people. I'll be able to give more people jobs and I'll be able to feed more people. So that's why I mean, that's been the best part of my pivot. That's a young gentleman that I literally took him off the streets and I trained him. And because of that, now he's like one of the top manicures at one of the day spots in Liberia. And he called me about a year ago to thank me. There's a very popular street in Liberia called Broad Street, and he was literally doing nails at Broad Street. You know, he calls me Sis Maisie. He was like, Sis Maisie, I just wanted to call you today just to tell you thank you so much because of nail therapy. I now think of myself so much better. Now I have a better place to live. Now I'm able to take care of my mom, my younger brother, my sister. But what really got me was when he said, now I'm going to go get my passport because I want to go to South Africa and do nails on a cruise ship. Wow. Yes. Because you're talking about a country that everyone has gone through 40 years of trauma. Liberia was at war for 20. The Civil War was 20. And then another 20 years of a little bit of unrest here and there. So all this trauma, but yet 
Oftentimes, when people bring people to the continent, they don't bring people that look like them. I look like them. I have been through what they have gone through to an extent, you know, but I made it out. But it's my job now to go back and take you to the next level. Yes, yes. And one of the things I love about what you're doing is that you're not only just kind of like going there ad hoc, you're talking to governments and saying, how can we create programs? How can we expand this? to reach more people. I want to bring people so that we can make these programs more in depth. So what made you do that part of it? And what was the reception like when you went to the government? What made me do it was because if you want to expand in Africa and have more of a footprint, especially if it's a give back project, you have to more or less have some level of government involved. And that's youth and gender. If I want to deal with the youth and gender, I want to go to the youth and gender ministries of these countries. In my case, now I've gone to ambassadors. In fact, Friday, I am going to a dinner that I was invited to, to the ambassador of Sierra Leone at his house. He's having a dinner for the outgoing Ghanaian ambassador. So there's going to be about maybe 16 ECOWAS ambassadors there. So I know the project that I want to do in these people's countries. So it would behoove me to be in the right place and be ready to pitch. But people have seen my reputation on ground. When I'm on ground, it's not about fluff and buff. I get on the floor with these people. You know, I'm not better than they are. And I don't make them feel like I'm better than you are. You are a human being just like me. Growing up as a kid, my mom used to beat me because we would go out. I would hang with the kids, the snot running out of their nose and all that. I really have not been that person that ever felt I was better than anyone. So I wasn't really raised to feel like I was better than anyone. So when I'm there, I'm in the trenches and they see that. And because they see that and they see that I'm genuine about what I say I'm going to do. And I back what I'm going to do by giving people products to start their own businesses. And I mentor them for a year throughout the process. And they see that these people have gotten successful. So I've proven what I said I'm going to do. So I'm able to make these connections with government and government officials. Yeah. So you have the case studies to back up what you've done. Yeah. And you're humble. And then they know that I'm humble. Yeah. You're like the epitomized servant leadership right now. You got to serve to lead. Exactly. And people mistake that a lot. You're almost like a quiet force, even though you're not like shy, because you do things that have big impact. And unless somebody talks to you, they won't know. Everybody says that. Oh my God. I'm saying I've known you for years. I don't know all of this. And I'm like, dang, she's seriously dope. She's got a lot of stuff on her. Everybody says that. I was on a panel the other day and a friend of mine, she was on the panel as well. And when we got off the panel, she was like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why aren't you telling people all this great stuff that you do? I'm like, I just do what I do. She was like, well, Ninja, you need to start talking. Yeah. So folks, meet Nazy Dunbar because she is a force, a global force. What's the unsung skill do you think that you need to make it? as an entrepreneur, or to make it in the beauty business, period. To make it in the beauty business and to make it as an entrepreneur, one, for me, this entrepreneurship language, I just started to really embrace it. Like I said, I just do what I do and I've done what I've done over the years just because I love what I do. We both know Ken Barboza. Ken is my agent, has been my agent for years. I don't really work under Ken like that anymore because it was part of my pivot to move from behind the scenes. So one of the things that Ken said to me when I told him what I was going to do, not doing shoots and stuff anymore, and it really meant so much to me that day. He said, Maisie, I must tell you that every time you were on set, I felt so calm at the office because I know your level of excellence. You know what that meant to me? You know Ken and you know his roster. Yes. So coming from someone like Ken, I never really thought of myself as anything other than just showing up and showing up to be the best person that I can be. So as an entrepreneur and as a beauty industry entrepreneur, I would say resiliency, being very resilient, being okay with falling and getting back up. But when you get back up, you got to get back up stronger than you have fallen. 
being okay with taking directions. You don't know it all. You can learn from your assistants. You can learn from anyone. And if and when you learn from that person, give people the credit that is so due to them. I think that's it. And show up and be you. Show up and be you. Just be 100% you all the time. 100% you. I love that. You mentioned that you didn't pay attention to Buffer Joe as much until COVID-19 in some ways. So how did COVID-19 impact your business? COVID-19 impacted my business in a very positive way. The reason why is because you know me, you know I be moving around a lot. I'm here, I'm there. So I had to sit still. And as the Bible says, be still. And part of that stillness, it really allowed me to really take a good look and assess myself, audit myself and audit my business. What is it that I am doing? What is it that I need to do better? You're now in the e-commerce space. I was still learning the e-commerce platforms. So it really, really allowed me to sit and be still. And during that time and being in that stillness, I was really able to give a lot of rebirth. To bluff a joke. I was able to look at things differently. You know, it's funny that everything you learn in life, it's a skill set that is building you up for something else. Even like working on set, making sure that my nail work was perfect because once that artist or whomever I'm working with got in front of that camera, you know, she was a whipper, y'all. You know, she ain't gonna tell me Maisie need to come and fix this. She gonna call Ken and say, I'm not hiring Maisie no more. <laughs> She laughing now, but it wasn't that. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, you know, my eyes had been trained over the years for design. And also even with Ken, before Ken decided to bring me on as a manicurist, I was representing him on set and I was representing myself. So in order for him to have me on his roster, he had to make sure that I was on point. So some of the things that when he looked at my images, when I went to him, he was like, no, this is not good enough. He turned me down 14 times. Wow. 14 times that joker turned me down. Well, on 15, he said, all right. Right, exactly. On 15, he said, all right. So again, resiliency, because each time he told me what he told me and I went back and I did it and I did it better. But now fast forward during COVID, all of those skill sets allowed me to take a look at Bluffer Joe in the lenses of people like you, you know, working on set with Essence, you know, doing backstage stuff, working for C&D as an educator, working for Sashay International as an educator, all of those things. I was going through those lenses and looking at Bluffer Joe through those lenses during COVID. And that's how I was able to thrive during COVID. Not that it's been easy. It hasn't, but it's okay. C&D and Sashay. Major brands. Yes. Don't have a lot of people that look like us as educators and influencers showing people what the latest and greatest are. So how did you come to, you know, start working with C&D? How I started working for C&D was I was working for what is called Sash Vite. I was one of the educators. And this is about preparation. We were at the trade show at Javis Center. I was fresh into the industry, I think probably a good year. I was using Sash Beat and I walked up to their booth. I was like, I really like your brand. I want to know if you guys are hiring anybody in the DMV area. And she was like, no, but if you have a resume, you can send it to me. I said, yeah, I have it right here. Pow, I popped it out. She hired me on the spot. So that's how I started. And I started off as an educator. Within a month, they promoted me to the Northeast Regional Director. So I was in Boston. I was here. I was there. I was everywhere. But then... Jen kept calling me because I use C&D products. I was still like doing all their classes or whatever. And I use all their products in my salon. So C&D at the time had a master program. So I had gone through the master program. And the way they had it was in order to be an educator, you first had to have gone through the master program. And when you go to the master program, they brought you to California for boot camp. And you had to pass boot camp. And literally it was like boot camp. So Jen kept asking me to come on, but I really liked my boss at Sash V. So I was very torn. So Jen and I was judging a competition in Atlanta. We got off stage. She was like, so Maisie, when are you coming? I said, Jen, I promise you I'm coming. I never told her that I really liked my boss at Sash V. That's why I wasn't going to. But the moment my boss quit, I caught Jen. I was like, I'm ready. 
Because I was like, I don't want to work with anybody else. The only thing that was kept in me there, I was very loyal to her because I'm very loyal. So when she quit, that's how I went to CND. And although Jan handpicked me, as they said at boot camp, I still had to prove something to myself and I still had to prove something to her. She handpicked me, but I think if I had gone to boot camp and I didn't know my products, I didn't know the future and benefits, and I didn't do the things that was necessary, they would not have hired me. So it was five days of intense training. And then the last day you had to present, they would throw these topics in a hat. You had to know future and benefits of the product. And you also had to know the product skews, all of that. So the throw these products in the hat, you just pick a product and you had to do a two minute presentation and you were judged on that. And that's how I started working for CND and I became an educator for them. Now they're global brand ambassador. So they definitely support all my projects of what I do on the continent and other places because I've been to South America, I've been to Cuba, all of those places. They've been hands on supporting me wherever I need and they really support my ventures. That's wonderful. Again, you got to show up as yourself. Absolutely. And make authentic connections too. I think that's a key that, you know, you met Jan, you made a connection and you maintained the connection. It wasn't like, okay, I'm only going to connect with her because I want a job because you didn't want a job. Exactly. For the longest time, you know, at that point in time, there was only a handful of us, maybe five out of maybe 250 educators. Only five of us was black. And people always say when we met for regionals, the y'all know Maisie was handpicked by Jan. And because of that stigma, I always wanted to make sure I showed up as myself. I was handpicked by Jan, as they would say, yes. Jan liked me. Jan liked me because I was about my business. I'm going to tell you, I don't get it twisted. Jan liked me because I was about my business. Now let's move on to our fast track questions. What was the first beauty product you ever purchased? Theon's number five, nail polish. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't remember Theon's number five? Uh-uh, I don't think so. Look it up online. You know you can still get it on Amazon. Girl, that thing was stinging your nails so bad. It has so much formaldehyde in it. Oh, my God. But that was my very first beauty product. What's the most recent beauty product you've tried? The most recent beauty product I've tried other than Bluffer Joe is... This natural deodorant, oh my God, it's upstairs. I forgot the name of it, but it's sold at Target. I've been using natural deodorant for over 20 years. And I used to use Dermalogica and then I started using another one. But this particular brand, it's called, I think it's Love and Love or Love and Something. It's at Target. That's the most recent beauty product I just tried. What's the beauty advice you live by or leave alone? The beauty advice I live by is making sure I floss my teeth. I'm big on making sure I take care of my teeth and my gums. I live by that. I floss every day, twice a day. I go to the dentist on regular basics um, about my smile, about my skin. So I'm very big on that. So those are the things that I live by. What do you leave alone? When it comes to beauty, I don't leave much alone. That's fine. That's the answer. What's the beauty trend you tried when you were younger that makes you laugh now? I took all my eyebrows off and I drew it on with a pencil. My mama beat me. <laughs> she said I was being womanish. I took the razor blade, shaved my eyebrows, put the pencil on, and I put red lipstick on. And my mother beat me. She said, you too womanish. You're trying to be a woman. You're just a kid. Who was your Black beauty icon growing up? And who deserves that status now? I would say my Black beauty icon growing up was Maria Makiba. And who I would say deserved that status now? Hi, Jesus. There's so many of them, though. You can name more than one. Okay. I love the artist, Yemi Alade. She's a Nigerian artist. I love her flair. I like with her music, the way she comes. Like, she brings it consistent with her beauty, I'm talking about. And I also like the fact that she's also true to her beauty outside of makeup and all of that. Beyonce, of course. Those two, I think, have similar beauty trends when it comes to their um, their outlook on how they present themselves. Here's the last question. If somebody wanted to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them? Gotta get up early in the morning. (laughs) You have to get up early in the morning. If you want to follow my footsteps, my advice I would give you is 
Make sure you put God first in all things you do. Always work from a good place of being who you are. If your gut doesn't tell you to do something, don't do it. Follow your gut at all times. Be very honest. Honesty is key. Be very, very honest. Don't have a hidden agenda. And always be willing to serve. Those are the advice that I would give. Well, absolutely amazing place to end this interview. Don't have a hidden agenda. We've got to do a whole show about that. Being authentic, like just the way that Maisie Dunbar does business is rooted in authenticity. And that is the word for all of us. To root your work in authenticity, to lead by serving and being an example to others. It's a simple statement that resonates so deeply. Yes. And it's not an easy, because we have egos, not easy place to get to, but we need to all get there. Yes, absolutely. Especially women of color, sometimes when we quote unquote think we have arrived, we get to be like that. And it's so funny, you know, when I go home, oftentimes, you know, people have very bad experiences with other people, but I haven't had that experience back home. I'm not only talking about Liberia, but I'm talking about even Nigeria. Like some great people have just really been in my space. And I think it's because of the energy that I put out. So people need to really check themselves. If you are gravitating towards a lot of negativity, a lot of people trying to tear you down, maybe you need to check yourself. What are some of the things that you have done and are doing that you are bringing this energy towards you? Yes. So check yourself. Remember to check stuff before you wreck yourself. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, (laughs) thanks again, Maisie, for being a guest. I can't thank you enough. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime. It was such a pleasure to be here. That's our show for today. Remember that there's more than one way to the top. And the most important step is the first one. So start right here. 